Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Smitty Story Hour featuring our guest speaker tonight, Craig Maluski. We're going to give everybody another minute or so to get logged in. Um, uh, when you have a moment, please uh, sign into the chat feature. Just tell us your name, maybe your class year, or where you're uh, joining us from. Um, if you have any questions throughout the evening, please send them through chat towards the end of the session. Dr. Maluski will um, answer those questions. Um, and don't be shy, please, any questions you have at all. We'll give everybody maybe one more minute and uh, we'll let Craig start from there. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, if I could just get a thumbs up from somebody saying that they can hear me. Heather, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so it looks like we're ready to go then. Well, um, it's my pleasure to be here uh, this evening for this uh, uh, Smitty story. And uh, uh, it was been, it been, it's been interesting today. I've been spending a lot of time going through a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, PowerPoints that I put together with students in the past and trying to figure out what the best story to tell is. Now, I know that I mentioned that um, I wanted to talk about long-term ecological monitoring and the legacy of experiential education at the college. And I will do that, but I'd also like to share a little bit of my own reflections toward the end as well. But anyways, just to introduce myself a little bit, <clears throat> I'm a Michigan native. Um, I went to Michigan State University for my undergrad, then I went out to South Dakota State University. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a little frog tonight. Um, got my master's, and after I uh, finished my master's in uh, fisheries, I went and worked as an uh, assistant fisheries research biologist for three years with a, a Minnesota Natural Resources in Southeast Minnesota. And uh, my first uh, job was to evaluate factors limiting game fish in southern Minnesota streams. After about three years there, I decided I wanted to go to school and get my PhD because quite honestly, I wanted to become a teacher at a small college. And here I am, um, but uh, my PhD work was uh, evaluating um, the, the relative influence of local and systemic controls on fish and fish habitat in different geologic uh, uh, climatic settings in, in South Dakota. And while I was finishing that up, I also worked for uh, East Dakota Water Development District in Eastern South Dakota, a 10 and a half county uh, wide region. And uh, my, I was hired as a uh, project coordinator to do watershed assessments. Um, and I was also uh, dubbed watershed ecologist, which at the time was quite scary to me. <laughs> you have to know a lot about watersheds for sure. Um, and be able to talk with a lot of other individuals who will uh, with a lot of expertise in other areas. Anyways, um, so I have some experience from these different jobs in the past that I have most certainly brought to Paul Smith's College with me. And uh, this, this uh, I want to start out by just having you uh, for a second focus on the photograph on this first slide. And um, cert most certainly you'll recognize Lower St. Regis Lake. This is a beautiful shot from one of our students, of course. Um, Lower St. Regis Lake, um, and then in the distance, you can see St. Regis uh, Mountain. Now, um, this uh, photograph here, I think, is a great starting point. Um, the lake, uh, I, I should also say I started at Paul Smith College, started teaching there in, let's see, the fall of 2003. And when I arrived here in the fall of 2003, I knew that uh, I wanted to set up some sites where I could with it, work with the students and do some long-term monitoring. 
And so obviously the lake was a great place to start. I was hired as a, as a fisheries biologist. So Lower St. Regis Lake um, was most certainly gonna be used for that, that type of work. But if you look off in the distance and on the north slope of St. Regis Mountain, um, I started at the same time that Dan Kelting did and Dan and I and uh, Corey Laxon, um, we decided to walk into uh, the north facing watershed because we wanted a small network of streams that we could also monitor. So starting in 2004, well in 2003, one of the things I was asked to do by uh, John Mills at that time, who was the provost, was to uh, spearhead the development of a fisheries and wildlife science program. There had already had been some discussions of, uh, among a small group of faculty before I got here, but we moved that forward. And by the fall of 2004, we had a fisheries and wildlife science program. And it was also that same fall when, we, when I started working with students to collect some long-term data on Lower St. Regis and um, what we dubbed Smitty Creek Watershed on the north side of St. Regis Mountain. So what I'd like to do is just kind of start there um, to talk about some of the long-term monitoring that has been done and how that has actually inspired or been used as a catalyst for, for other work as well. So let me see here. Oops, sorry, a little bit of delay there. All right, so uh, I, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on what, I, what we call Smitty Creek Watershed, other than to say that um, uh, when in 2004, I walked up in that watershed with about eight, nine students in uh, fisheries techniques. And I, and I said to them, we walked through the air watershed, I said, okay, um, if you were going to set up a long-term uh, monitoring program, looking at fish and physical habitat in these streams, how would you go about doing it? Where would you set up the, uh, the reaches? And this is what we came up with. And so you can see this is on the, on the, the north slope, the, the very lower left, lower right hand corner reaches right up to the peak of St. Regis Mountain up there by the tower. And uh, there, we, we dubbed the, the main stem Smitty Creek, um, only afterward did we find out that there was a name for it. We named the other creeks Aldo Creek, Little Aldo Creek, and Beaver Brook. And uh, that picture that you see there with the students, um, every year, uh, I take the students up there in stream ecology or fisheries techniques, techniques, definitely stream ecology, and I describe the story about how um, the monitoring sites were established. And then we begin our work. And uh, um, I, I won't, again, I won't go into the details. I'd like to spend some time on some of the other projects. But this is a place where we can go in, with the students and, and uh, learn how to measure the physical characteristics of the stream. Um, some really basic, simple tools. Um, we, we sample um, the fish communities at, at at least four of the six reaches every year. And this is just an example of what we've been able to do now that we have collected data, not for just one year, two year, three years, but for uh, many years. And um, these are, the, again, the study reaches that we, we go to on a regular basis, just to give you a visual of what they look like. Um, uh, Maybe there's some of you out there that'll recognize yourself in these photographs. Unfortunately, I can't, can't see who's out there right th at the moment. But anyways, um, focusing on Little Aldo Creek, which is the most stable out of the systems, um, students looked at the age zero brook trout density um, and compared that with some um, overwinter uh, ambient air temperatures and uh, precipitation based on uh, nearby um, weather stations. And it's been interesting. Um, in this particular case, they, uh, one student found that age zero brook trout density uh, seemed to be correlated with mean February, positively correlated with mean February temperature. But this is just an example of the kind of um, oh, explorations that we can do with long-term monitoring. But what I'd like to do is uh, uh, switch to uh, Lower St. Regis Lake. And so you're, you are all, I'm sure uh, very familiar with Lower St. Regis Lake. And um, um, you, you know that it was the site of, uh, starting in the late 1850s, early 60s uh, resort that Paul Smith College, or Paul Smith, excuse me, uh, created here uh, on the lake shore. And, uh, oh, what was it? Uh, 
the late 40s or so, um, 50s, that it became, uh, was converted to a campus with a, quite a history there. But anyways, the lake has been, um, at, at one point in time, had a, quite an influx of uh, a sewage into the lake, even in the early days of Paul Smith's college. And um, uh, so it, there's, a, there's a history here that, that can be unraveled or un, uh, disentangled, I guess, and understood. So the Lower St. Regis Lake, you know, you all, I won't have to spend a whole lot of time other than to say it's, a, it's part of a chain of lakes. It is uh, part of the headwaters to the St. Regis River, uh, which is a tributary to St. Lawrence, 350 acres with a maximum depth of 35 feet. And uh, uh, for this part of the long-term monitoring, um, well, how to tie that, how to tie, a big part of this was trying to develop a hysterical narrative of change and relate that to past fish community data, uh, stocking records, historical accounts, and what the students in the last 17 years have been collecting on, uh, during the regular um, uh, annual fall sampling. But just a, it, it's very interesting to try to understand um, what a place may have had for uh, any kind of uh, biological community prior to um, any uh, big development uh, during settlement or post-settlement. Um, there's this book, and by the way, I, I, I need to, um, uh, I want to recognize Mike Recklin here for, for starting this inquiry into this historical account. And uh, Mike kept pushing us along here, and, and, he, and he certainly uh, had uh, the experience, the direct experience and the history of uh, uh, Paul Smith's college and the development of the uh, EET program. Uh, well before I got here. So anyways, this work is actually building on, on that part of the Paul Smith's college history. But anyways, in this book by I Go, uh, titled I Go Fishing by William Prime, there's a couple historical accounts. And this is pre-stocking pre fish. And so this is interesting. 1860, he, he writes, from him, an old guide, I learned that brook trout were abundant in one part of the pond close by the house. The fish rose at every cast, and when I had half a dozen of the same sort, a little less than two pounds, and one that lacked only an ounce of being four pounds. We pulled up the Achillic and paddled homeward. And this, this uh, yellow dot on the map is where he went. Uh, very interesting. He described the Tamarack Swamp off to his left as they went around the point and then the inlet and the, uh, the flipping up of lily pad leaves. So. It wasn't too early in the spring, uh, the, the lily pads were at the surface of the water. And then there's a, he has an 1872 account as well. I looked out across the lake to Peter's Rock and wondered whether trout would rise to a fly over there as in other years. So it gives you an idea that uh, this lake, Lower St. Regis, had a uh, population of brook trout in them, in it. Um, and then the stocking began in 1884. And you can see throughout the late 1800s all the way up to the mid 1950s, um, cold water species were largely introduced into the lake. Um, and somewhere along the line, it looks like folks just gave up and largemouth bass uh, were stocked at one time in 1974. Now, it's a 350 acre lake and you can imagine looking at the size of the resort at that time, the, the fishing pressure that must have, must have occurred on the lake um, and put that on top of some of the other, other changes to the lake like the uh, inputs of, um, of nutrients from waste. Anyways, um, and then taking a look at the fish surveys here and I want to make it clear here what kind of gears were used. The 1930 um, 1930 survey by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation um, was really quite extensive. They used trap nets, gill nets, minnow traps, and seines. And 70s, uh, trap nets and gill nets would, were used. 1980s, trap nets and gill nets. <clears throat> and then in 2004 to present, trap nets, gill nets occasionally, minnow traps, bag seine, shoreline electrofishing. Uh, but the following slides are only going to deal um, with the fish presence rather than all the other uh, typical population characteristics um, that are used. Um, so uh, don't pay too much attention to all these words. 
All I want to say here is that the, the DEC at one point in time had a really rough um, classification of lakes. Deep lakes that were assumed to support oxygen demanding trout, shallow warm water lakes supporting only warm water fishes, and shallow cold water lakes with some cold water species persisting during the warm summer months. Um, Lower St. Regis itself was not classified, but adjacent Spitfire Lake was classified as a shallow cold water lake and being similar in characteristics, um, had a very similar fish community as well. And so um, for, uh, in a simple way, I've just defined three general assemblages, a cold water assemblage, including brook trout, a cool water assemblage comprised of a diversity of minnows and a few warm water species. Um, this is what the fish species composition looked like in 1930. Several cold water species, including a long nose sucker, um, seven cool water species. Now you could haggle whether they fall into the cold water, warm water category, but we'll just keep it here for now. Uh, seven cool water species of minnows. Four of these are still found in Heron Marsh. And then for the warm water species, what they caught in the 1930 survey was white sucker, brown bullhead, and pumpkin seed. That's in 1930. Uh, 1971 to 1973, you can see uh, a big shift uh, all the mineral species were gone. Uh, Non-native mineral species, the um, uh, um, golden shiner uh, had been introduced by that time. Um, and the surveys uh, in, in many respects were at that time the dominant species was white sucker. 1980, things changed a little bit. Uh, large mouth bass was present but now so was the Northern Pike, and uh, they actually caught some uh, um, smelt in uh, these smaller gill nets. Uh, 2004 to present. So this is, this is what the lake uh, has for a fish composition now. Every once in a while, a cold water fish will be caught late in the fall if we have a trap net out for demonstration purposes. Um, but uh, you can see that the lake is largely a warm water fish composition and a couple cool water species. Now just imagine yourself for a moment being a minnow in this lake. Um, it, it, it'd be more like a predator uh, gauntlet for the most part. Um, and so we, even putting uh, minnow traps out, it's, we have yet to capture any minnows other than a golden shiner. So this is what 1931 looked like. And this is what the lake looks like today. Okay, um, I, won't, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on this particular timeline. I just wanna pick out a couple points along the way here. Uh, at the very beginning, 1858, the development began uh, when Apollo Smith purchased 50 acres along the shoreline. Uh, in 1896, uh, Keys Mills was built, Keys Mills Dam was built, raising the water level. I think that's very important to understand. Um, somewhere along the line, it was raised a second time. Let's see, re homeowners did recognize there was definitely a wastewater quality problem. In 68, it was the worst cyanobacteria bloom observed. Um, of course, the uh, Clean Water Act was passed in 72. Um, 2004, long-term monitoring started. And I just wanna point out in 2019, um, because of the, the increase in the water level, shoreline erosion can, does continue to be observed. And that may be an issue as well. Um, uh, Pre-dam or post-dam and pre-dam, it's hard to say, you know, trying to reconstruct the hydraulic regime on the lake um, uh, could serve uh, a better understanding of, of what might be happening on the lake. You raise the water level up and you can start to increase shoreline erosion. And if you have the logging in the area as well, it might reduce inputs of logs into the lake. And um, as studies have shown that um, if you remove the large wood debris along the shoreline, a lot of organic matter actually gets washed out into the lake. So what was the thermal regime? It might be worth in time trying to reconstruct what that might be under different um, hydrologic regimes. This is an example of some of the shoreline erosion that still occurs. This is out by the ropes course. Um, about 10 years ago, this white pine was alive and standing tall. Now it's making some pretty good fish cover. You see lures wrapped around the branches from time to time. This is across, from the, across the way from the cabin. 
Um, 71, this is that cyanobacteria bloom, lower St. Regis, you can see it from the, uh, how, how it contrasts with Spitfire. Um, and a lot of these figures here relate to water quality or complements of uh, Corey Laxon too. Um, Corey's done an excellent job reconstructing uh, the water quality of, of the lake over time. And you can see uh, a, a problem here. In the summertime, um, when the lake develops a thermocline, thermocline um, the cold water uh, portion of the lake, the lower portion, the lower depths are also oxygen depleted. So a, a cold water species is not going to uh, do very well in the lake in the summertime. <clears throat> um, what is interesting is the lake uh, trophic state does uh, appear to have a trend of going from eutrophic conditions to uh, perhaps mesot uh, more mesotrophic conditions. Of course, there's a lot of variation there. The lake water quality does appear to be improving. So there's the question, can a largely non-indigenous fish community be used to assess the health of a lake that has been substantially altered? Um, well, um, I won't answer that question just yet, but I, I do want to just uh, uh, show here that in 2004, we did start that standardized sampling. So the fishery students um, have been sampling Lower St. Regis Lake using the same gear in the same location, same time of year, catch a lot of I gather a lot of data on catch rates, age and size structure, growth rates, year class strength and body condition, all the usual things that would go into a fishery survey. Here's the sites around the lake where the nets are, are set. Um, this gives you an idea, this is the total catch, so it's not a catch rate here, but it gives you an idea how the fish community has changed. Um, when we first started surveying here, we did not catch much for um, rock bass. Uh, but those entered the lake and uh, the brown bull has their densities have gone down and usually the ones we catch now are uh, pretty hefty. Um, black crappie were introduced and uh, I think the first time we caught a black crappie I should say was 2012, 2013 and their population has gone up very quickly. Um, their size structure is pretty good but the, the anglers are, I tell you what the students in particular are keying in on the black crop in the winter time. Uh, so back to that question, can non-indigenous communities be used? I would say yes. Um, however, there also needs to be a shift, a shift in perspective toward uh, comprehensive ecological studies and instead of just focusing purely on the fish community. And so in 2014, I wanna mention this, uh, uh, an ecological restoration program started in 2015 here at Paul Smith College. And in 2014, knowing that um, an ecological restoration program was going to be launched, um, it seemed like a good opportunity to, do, to, to have students in a capstone project um, perform a shoreline restoration ecology study. And I like to describe this as a small case study with big lessons uh, so far. Uh, over 200 students have been either been involved uh, directly with the study of the shoreline um, or have been used this project as part of a classroom. So there's several things that can be looked at, fragmentation and connectivity, loss of physical complexity, loss of biodiversity. Um, and so this shoreline assessment over time has, an, has uh, the, the ecological assessment has been quite comprehensive. Uh, trees and understory, soil traits, shoreline woody structure, leaf litter, organic matter, invertebrates on um, wood and the nearshore substrates, uh, invertebrates on the shoreline, and, and the trust, terrestrial invertebrates, fish use of shoreline resources, wind, snow accumulation, and also aesthetic preferences and ethical considerations. So just a background on the case study. Some of you may be familiar with the break wall out front, um, something that might be found in a typical developed area. There's a lot of wind and wave action there. Uh, compared to an aquatic crystal transition zone, it still has its natural processes intact on the right. And so it's like, well, uh, this could be a prime target for a shoreline restoration, even if it does not get restored, although we did get funding for restoration of it, um, having a degraded site can serve uh, uh, educational purposes as well. 
Um, I want to point out that uh, the students, again, did look at wind coming off the lake. And this is important, I think, to understand that just having trees along the lake creates an air cushion right next to the lake. And in addition to that uh, air cushion that uh, heavy vegetation will create, just the presence of large woody structure will also break the shoreline uh, wind activity. And, and, and as a result, you have retention of organic matter. Um, we defined levels of impact as one would do in an ecological restoration project or restoration assessment, uh, defining impacted, minimally impacted, and reference conditions. Uh, minimally impacted and impacted were sites were located on Lower St. Regis, reference sites on Black Pond. Um, uh, the, the sampling was standardized so that all these different projects could be overlaid on each other, providing insight um, of one, one study to the next. Um, so um, you can see some of the different studies that were done. I'm going to move, uh, just, just for the sake of time, I'm going to move through this. Um, because I have a, <laughs> I had to cut a lot of slides out today. Anyway, shoreline vegetation, see the canopy cover um, and minimally impacted and reference uh, sites were much higher than the shoreline out in front of the school, which we describe as impacted. Um, the obligate wetland species richness was higher at the minimally impacted or reference sites. Facultative upland species were higher at the um, impacted and minimally impacted sites. So. Uh, just this information alone suggests that the shores that are uh, minimally impacted or unimpacted tend toward wetland conditions. Uh, the volume of woody debris at the minimally impacted and reference sites was much higher than impacted sites. Um, even at the, and at the reference sites, the uh, students also um, looked at the uh, level of decomposition. And at the reference sites, it's much higher on average than at the minimally impacted sites, just showing that the woody debris had been in the lake for a longer period of time. Uh, autumn leaf litter. I, 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 right now, I wish I could rip off the names of every single student who was involved with each part of these, but uh, um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe my mind's going a little bit, but I uh, can't keep up with it all. But anyways, um, I just want you to focus on this for a moment. Don't worry about the reference sites because it's mostly conifers over there, but compare the impacted and minimally impacted sites. And so at the impacted sites, the terrestrial uh, leaves density was much higher, in terms of dry weight was much higher than in the aquatic zone right next to the shoreline where the terrestrial uh, leaves were collected. Um, and at the minimally impacted sites, the aquatic, uh, the dry weight of leaves in the aquatic zone were higher than in the terrestrial zone. Um, and it most certainly suggests in these areas where you have the presence of, of uh, large woody structure in near shore areas, it also serves to collect this leaf litter uh, when it falls into the lake. Uh, another interesting part here is the uh, organic matter um, at the reference sites over in uh, the uh, over at Black Pond, coarse and fine particulate organic matter was much higher than minimally impacted or impacted sites. And further, the fine particulate organic matter at the reference sites was much higher than the coarse at the reference sites, which suggests that that organic matter has been there for a longer period of time compared to say the minimally impacted sites. Um, so there's that organic matter retention along the lake that's important. So um, how does this impact parts of the other? How is it related to other ecosystem characteristics? Well, uh, another group of students looked at the soil characteristics. And at the reference sites in the left figure there, the, the percentage of organic matter was uh, significantly higher than at the impacted sites, which would suggest that uh, the organic matter from the leaves and the vegetation growing near the ground um, would add to that organic matter over time. And again, it, it's something you would see uh, typical of, of wetland conditions. Uh, looking at the bulk density, reference the bulk density at the reference sites was much lower than the bulk density of soil at the impacted sites where you would have constant mowing and uh, treading upon, uh, constant mowing and the, and the equipment of lawnmowers would certainly help keep that compacted, but also if you're nipping off the, the vegetation, above ground vegetation, you're using that part of the 
plant that's also going to feed uh, uh, the growth of roots. So anyways, uh, soil conditions were quite a bit different. What about the invertebrates and vertebrates? Um, in the terrestrial invertebrates at the minimally impacted and reference sites, it was interesting that arachnids, the spiders, at a higher um, mean number than the insects. And at the impacted sites, the, uh, the insects uh, were, had a higher number uh, than the impacted sites. I wish I could give you the, the actual units on that. I think it's number per sweep net, distance of sweep net. Um, but anyways, this suggests that perhaps spiders are a fairly good predator or the habitat might be more suitable for them. I know if you walk through thick vegetation sometimes in an early sunny morning, um, you're peeling a lot of uh, spider webs off yourself. Um, at least strands suggesting that there's a arachnid population there worth paying attention to. Aquatic invertebrates on woody structure at the reference sites and minimally impacted sites, they were higher than the impacted sites. Um, so uh, just the amount of woody debris um, in a lake is going to influence the density of aquatic invertebrates on the woody debris or woody structure, I should say. In uh, just looking at invertebrate uh, benthic macroinvertebrates and different substrates. Uh, this was very interesting. This is combining all sites uh, for the two lakes where you had in organic substrates, uh, 16 different families of invertebrates were found compared to uh, mixed substrates or inorganic substrates. Inorganic being substrates like sand and gravel. So again, that retention of that organic matter near shore areas is important. Um, I'll just show one slide here, which I find quite fascinating, is the, um, the density of odinates uh, at benchmark sites uh, where you had a lot of uh, organic matter was much higher than the minimally impacted or impacted sites. Fish diet, um, another interesting uh, aspect of, of this study, showed that uh, fishes using nearshore areas, age, young a year fishes using nearshore areas, had a higher look at the center two bars, had a higher percentage of macroinvertebrates compared to zooplankton, the, the left two bars, while those offshore had a higher percentage of zooplankton in their stomachs than macroinvertebrates. And these macroinvertebrates in the stomachs of fishes were also the same macroinvertebrates that were found on the woody structure. Um, just a catch of age zero by impact level. Um, minimally impacted sites, comparing three minimally impacted and three impacted sites. And this is on, just on St. Regis Lake. Um, uh, you, you, you wouldn't even have to do a statistical analysis here to show that uh, minimally impacted sites have significantly higher uh, fish densities than impacted sites. So that woody structure, that retention of organic matter is important to age zero fishes. Um, there was a, a, a preference study. Um, where students did um, do a survey of the, uh, several students did a survey of the student body of staff and faculty. And this was not a preferred condition on the lake. Uh, something that would had uh, uh, more vegetation, more shrubs along the shoreline, a few trees was preferred over this. So this is, an, this is what one of the uh, interviewers or or one of the people filled out, one of the students who filled out a survey wrote down, I get a rundown kind of feeling, unnatural, public, boring, very overused. And of course, it's also a great place for uh, Canada geese. We have a, about 20 or 30 geese that like to use the shoreline and make it unusable or unfit uh, for use. And so all this work um, has been used by uh, ecological restoration students to actually develop a plan. Um, and they employed other information as the, the students who uh, were in the surveying class surveyed the shoreline. So you can see the pros, a proposed break wall profile. Um, and their, their thought was to turn this all into a meadow. Put a few more trees there, turn it into a meadow. And um, between the big willow and the canoe launch there, grade that shoreline, uh, remove the break wall, grade the shoreline and put in um, natural vegetation uh, that would help keep the geese off the shoreline, increase the diversity of the area, increase the aesthetic value of the shoreline, just make it more attractive and, 
and in a way uh, show that um, uh, we are walking the talk. But that also led to this study um, here. Uh, the shoreline students suggested that the shoreline could be used as a pollinator plot. And um, it was decided too that there was a little bit too much mowing going on on campus. And this became an inspiration to develop pollinator plots on, on the campus. And uh, in restoration ecology, I decided to take this as an opportunity last fall to start a metal restoration uh, project. And so this is, you can see the, the first year that they laid off of mowing these areas. And of course, that's going to save on gas and oil and uh, everything else. And it's been interesting. Um, so this is another new long-term project, if you will. And here's a couple slides here, uh, just showing some early results. Um, uh, finally, I just want to, <clears throat> um, I, I do want to mention that there's a couple other long-term projects in the making as well. Um, over at the Vic, hopefully, it's an early discussion discussion phase right now about trying to create forest complexity plots, um, uh, just to show that you can take maybe an 80-year-old forest and uh, bring in some uh, woody structure, woody debris, and arrange it in such a way to uh, give it the attributes of an older forest. Um, we'll see where that goes. But just uh, just a little bit of reflection. When I came to Paul Smith's College. Um, before I even got here, um, I knew that uh, experiential education um, was a big part of the college, that direct personal experience. And it's one of the reasons one of the reasons why I was in this college. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to teach at a small college. And here I am. But um, somewhere along the line, I, I, as I've gone through this, I do from time to time ask myself, what is education for? Um, and this is, this, I take this from an essay that Aldo Leopold wrote, um, what is education for, a question that he asked. And um, this is part of a, an essay related to um, liberal education. And he was not describing this in terms of uh, programs. He was describing this as um, ecology uh, being useful within a liberal education for all students, teaching them, to, and, and he, this is a paraphrase, uh, um, teaching students to see, to understand what they see, and enjoy what they understand. And this makes a whole lot of sense to me. I can remember walking around a drying up pond in South Dakota, eastern South Dakota, and picking up carp bones and looking at this carpal perculum and asking myself, how in the world did this get there, get here? And um, with a little bit of thought, I could relate that, that carp operculum to the El Nino Southern Oscillation out in the Pacific Ocean and how to influence the wet dry cycles and the movement of, of fishes like carp up into these wetlands that would again eventually dry or die during dry cycles. So, and I, and I like this, uh, I like this, uh, another phrase, another quote from A River Runs Through It by Norman McLean. It goes something like this, all there is to thinking is seeing something noticeable, which makes you see something you didn't notice before, which makes you see something that's not even visible. And for me, that starts to be the real value <clears throat> of education, what education is for. And I came about this partly as a result of my experience as a fish biologist in southern Minnesota and as a watershed ecologist out in South Dakota. And um, I had the, the naive idea as a young scientist that if, if we put in the hands the best scientific information on the ecology of an area, uh, that people will just automatically want to restore it, things like that. And I realized that just simply was not the case. Um, Things like uh, subsurface tiling and, and drainage ditches were uh, going full steam ahead in some parts of Minnesota, for example. Um, the same things that were actually causing the major problems with game fishes in, in, uh, in these southern Minnesota streams. And um, I thought about this truth model. 
This was a truth model that was given to me as a graduate student in a research, wildlife research design course. And I share this with students, this truth model, this subjective realm of human and this objective realm of nature. And as we bring things in through, through our senses, uh, through our perceptions, um, our sensory perceptions, um, our experience, our biases uh, come into play. And as a scientist, we attempt to minimize that bias with lit by performing a literature review, uh, creating a good study, uh, learning technical skills and techniques, as well as critical thinking. I would put creative thinking in there as well. And it was clear to me that science as a body of knowledge, as a method of inquiry, um, was not separate from any kind of management process, but it was totally integrated into the management process. It's always kind of uh, boggled me uh, when people have made the distinction between science and management when science, in my opinion, is in service of management. And so in this whole management process, the method of inquiry, the body of knowledge, uh, collecting that field, initial field data is like a, initial data is like a field study, implementing a, or developing a plan and uh, trying to restore an area, for example, the whole thing can then be set up as a field experiment. experiment. And all that is great. Um, but it seemed to me that something still is missing. And this is something I, I tried to bring on into the course. And it, I, it occurred to me, um, probably, okay, I'll say this, in about 2012 or so, I, I decided, I ended up getting a Master of Fine Arts in writing. And it made me explore a little bit further because I wanted to uh, be better at telling a story. If someone would have told me as a scientist, Craig, you better be able to tell us a story that uses scientific information in a really good and compelling way. I think that would have helped out a lot um, with some of the angst I was feeling as a young scientist. And so telling a story is important. And so there is, I, I, I suggest to students, some of you have heard this from me before, I'm sure if you're listening in, that you as an organism are at the intersection of several things. I call this an imperfect model, levels of organization, history and its legacy effects. I mean, if you're studying ecology, it's, it's inevitable you're gonna uh, learn about history and its legacy effects. But there's something else that's really driving so much of this, and this is um, ethics and worldview or cosmologies. Um, Maybe there's an ecological and social conscience that develops in human beings, but it seems like that's often in contrast with everything else is being put forward as a, some kind of commodity. And where, where are we, where do these three intersect? Um, so, um, this whole idea of having a concrete experience as a scientist, reflecting on that experience, learning from it, um, becoming aware of one's own understanding of the thought process is important. But part of that reflection on the experience uh, has to go beyond just the, uh, the collection of scientific data, but bringing in uh, things like uh, uh, the humanities. And so uh, just thinking about that a little bit, are there other ways of perceiving and experiencing? Um, yes, there are other ways. Um, I like this quote by Higgs. It's re this is related to uh, ecological restoration. Maintaining a broader approach to restoration requires respect for other kinds of knowledge than science, and especially the recognition of a moral center that is beyond the scope of science to address fully. I like the idea that we absolutely need science, but if we brought the humanities in to help us understand the um, uh, moral ramifications of what we do as humans, that would help. And uh, it would not diminish science at all. It would actually, in my opinion, elevate uh, the respect and use of science. So, and this brings me back to uh, like Aldo Leopold and his writing and the writings of others. And so somewhere along the line, around 2012, I think, I thought I'd have a special uh, topics course. What would Aldo Leopold do? And here's the students in that first class, what would all the Leopold do? Sitting underneath a big hemlock out at the Vic. 
and um, it it took off. Uh, I was surprised um, by the enthusiasm for the course. It was fun. It took me a while to develop it, but I did. And so when I got this uh, MFA degree, my thesis, my critical thesis was poetry and the stirring of an ecological conscience. And um, I think about Gary Snyder and his definition of poetry. He defines it as the, the skilled use of voice, uh, metaphor, and experience to capture rare and powerful states of mind that are at once personal to the singer, yet understood by all who listen. And I think that's what it is for me, is that this idea that there's something out there that we can't quite put it into words, but it's a stirring, the stirring of an ecological conscience, borrowing uh, the words from Aldo Leopold. And so there's a kind of composting of one's self that can occur uh, that, oh, how do I want to say it, actually helps cultivate something new. And I would call it the stirring of an ecological conscience. Actually, I'm just borrowing that, of course. Um, and through contemplative practices and bringing that into the classroom. And so this, this one credit course turned into a three credit course, the stirring of an ecological conscience. And in this course, um, students uh, write short essays like the origins. The first essay is origin. So we do a lot of reading, a whole lot of reading in that course. This uh, search for the stirrings, where do they come from? Inevitably, most of the students talk about that time between they were eight, 10, 12 years old, um, that something happened for, uh, for them. There's a transformative experience, but it's not always recognizable until we actually think about it a little bit. We talk about our education and uh, how this, how we can integrate um, our new learning and how we can integrate that and how do we emerge out of that uh, through transformative moments. Um, an essay must be written on the ineffable. That is that thing that cannot be put into words. But what is this stirring of an ecological conscience? And finally, and this relates, this circles right back around to um, ecological monitoring, a purposeful arrangement of self. Um, going to these places, these long-term monitoring sites, sitting there quietly and finding some kind of inspiration from a place that's difficult to define, writing a poem or a short uh, 300 to 500 word essay, going back to the site, and, uh, getting inspiration each time at, with each visit. And so at the end of the semester, um, the students, and some of you may, I hope there's some of you out there that will recognize yourself in this, in this uh, photograph here. Uh, each spring, the Turtle Island readings, everyone has in that cat class has to read a poem or a, a piece of an essay. And uh, the first time we did this, everyone was done reading. It was a sunny day and no one wanted to leave. And for the next half hour uh, or so, give or take, everyone just sat there quietly without a peep something was happening. And uh, this is the last slide um, that I'll share. And I, I think this kind of says it all. What is education for? Nothing so important as an ethic is ever written. It evolves in the mind of a thinking community. And I would suggest a thinking community that embraces sciences, the sciences, but also embraces the humanities. And so um, I hope, uh, hope you enjoyed this. Um, I put this together today. Um, it was quite a challenge to cut a uh, slide presentation down from 200 to 80 and then to scream through these in 40 minutes. So um, let me see here. I know at this point, <clears throat> the questions come from the chat and because I, I can't multitask very well, I'm gonna go to the chat section um, um, Craig, I can read the one question I have found. Uh, David okay. Bly asked, um, was uh, the lake, and he's referring to Lower St. Regis, was the lake formed by Keys Mill Dam, or was there natural lakes prior to that dam? Um, there, the Lower St. Regis Lake was there, 
Um, the, probably the surface area was um, smaller than what it is now. And um, some of those, it looks, just looking at a map, it looks like uh, the, with the raising of the water twice actually, um, that it inundated some shallow areas, uh, less than two meters. So the lake was probably smaller and as a result probably may have had a, a different, well, most certainly had a different depth to it. Uh, the lake level was probably raised, if I can wager a guess, about eight feet, give or take. So yes, the lake did exist, um, but didn't have the, the surface area. Um, it did it originally. Um, we have another question in the chat from Alexandra Phillips. I'm not clear about the, oh, I'm not sure what she's saying here. Are you saying that they were found in a more disturbed area? The word I'm unclear on is O-D-O-N-A-T-A. -A. Oh, the odnates. odnates. It is a word. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a hotelie. I'm really lost. <laughs> so, so put that in the question one more time. Okay. I was not clear about the onates. Are they are you saying that they were found in a more disturbed area? Uh, no, they were found in less disturbed areas. The, the onates were found in areas that had high um, amounts of coarse and fine particulate organic matter. Okay. Um, Rebby Romeo. What do you see as the future of the intersection of arts and sciences at PSC? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Rebbe, you might know that a, a group of faculty gathered up a couple years ago um, from a, a different departments and different disciplines and have uh, put together a plan for to develop an environmental humanities minor, actually a whole environmental humanities uh, uh, BA program, but um, if we can get an environmental humanities minor off the ground, that would be great. And we wanted to make it uh, a type of minor that would be um, useful for students in all our programs, not just science programs. Um, someone asked if there was any data collected. I saw it earlier and now it's disappeared. Any data on Bear Pond? Oh wait, maybe it's down here. And then someone else answered back that Kurt Steger had actually done a project there. Um, yes, and that information was shared in the chat and there's actually a link to the data on the adirondackwatershed.org site. Um, Emily Segata, class of 2020, would like to know your favorite memory from teaching at PSC. From 2020? Oh yeah, Emily Segata. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my favorite memory. Oh. You know, it'd be very difficult to point to uh, one, but I can point to um, the type of environment that exists when I'm having one of those really good moments. And that is when I'm sitting quietly, like in this last slide here with a bunch of students, just taking in the surroundings. <clears throat> in, in two courses, stream ecology, every fall, the first, our first field trip is a walk into the watershed. And when we get up to that tree that where we, in 2004, that I tacked a map to the tree and decided on the, on the sites, I asked the students to sit, just sit here quietly for five to 10 minutes before we head back. And um, it's just another way of getting to know the watershed and the surroundings. And also, um, Lower St. Regis Lake, an ecological restoration ecology or ecological restoration, going to the inner sanctum. Um, and there's a little wooded area there, and we we take observations when we're sitting there quietly. Um, my favorite moments with students are when we're sitting quietly in the woods or along the lake. Um, there was a, sh a shaman from Nicaragua who came up many years ago uh, to Paul Smith's college. And uh, he, he could not speak English, but he was speaking through an interpreter. 
And um, someone raised their hand and asked this question, how do we help our students become, he said our purpose is to help students to become wise. Someone raised their hand and asked the question, well, how do we help our students become wise? And he just swept his hand out to the lake and said, have them sit by the lake. Now I know that that uh, sounds kind of whimsical and perhaps for some a bit woo woo, but sitting by the lake is uh, I think a good place to, a good place where perhaps the narrow bounds of self fall away and you feel yourself some, a, a part of something larger. It's a long answer to it, long answer to a short question. Um. Let's see. Can you see a change of other organisms with the changing of fish population? Um, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't be able to answer that. In the, in the lake itself, Lower St. Regis Lake, um, if I were to think of any other organisms other than fishes that would change with the fish community, uh, fish eating birds might come to mind and but the, uh, most certainly the uh, um, loon is having no problem out there on the lake feeding on fish. Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I may have missed a few questions here, so I'll try and look back. Uh, what are your plans for future writing? Maybe a book? That's from Jim Allen. Oh, Jim. Yeah. Um, hey, Jim. Um, well, um, I have a manuscript of poems that I'm working on right now. It's getting close. Um, I started putting together a selection of essays that uh, could almost take the form of a memoir. <clears throat> um, one of the things that I would like to do is um, put together a selection of poems and essays that the students have written as a part of the, the, the Leopold or the Stirring of an Ecological Conscience class. There's excellent poems and short essays. And uh, I do have a, what I'd like to do too is put a little book together on poetry and the stirring of a little, poetry and the stirring of an ecological conscience. So that's where my mind is at on that right now. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Have the beavers returned to upper, oh, and then somebody else asked the question and I lost it. I think it was Smitty Creek. To Beaver Brook, yes. Um, yes, about, uh, oh, I don't know, four or five years ago, someone went up there and trapped all the beaver out of Beaver Brook and uh, Smitty Creek and uh, all the, beaver dams uh, went into disrepair and became leaky and some uh, bursted out. Um, in the last couple of years, the uh, beaver have returned, um, not at the densities that they were, but uh, perhaps uh, the numbers will increase and uh, the beaver dams will be alive and active. So it's good to see. <coughs> Okay, I'm gonna take two last questions because I think we're just about out of time. So the, the second to last question, and I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, have you taken the new president out on some canoe trips? I should. If, <laughs> if, John, if you're listening to me, if that's your question, um, either a, a, a trip out in the canoe or, or maybe even a, a long walk up into Smitty Creek watershed, um, that's, that's fun as well. Uh, one of my favorite times to go up to Smitty Creek Watershed is right after the snow has melted and just before the black flies come out. Good plan. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Strauss has joined us this evening, but I'm sure he'll be up for the challenge. Um, I have one last one, and this is a request from Bob, I'm pretty sure. Craig, can you send us off with a poem? Oh, uh, well. That, and he'd like to go ice fishing, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can send you off with a poem. Uh, let me open up my folder here. <clears throat> and 
and while he's preparing his poem, just so you know, I will get a, a copy of these chat messages and send them to Craig um, probably tomorrow. Craig, I want you to see all the kind words that you're you're hearing. And if I missed any questions, then Craig could possibly respond. Um, there was quite a lot of activity tonight, so thank you all for that. All right. Um, well. I'll grab a short one here. Um, I wrote this uh, after last last spring. Um, I was just totally burned out. I had uh, six classes and one independent study that all went online. And so I had a course overload to begin with. And the only thing I wanted to do after the end of the semester was uh, stare at the trees. Sin sincerely, that's I just was just totally burned out. I'm glad we made it through the semester. And um, sitting and looking at the at the tree outside my window one morning or one evening excuse me and i had uh, an interesting bird that was coming around on a regular basis i don't mow my lawn i rarely mow my lawn and uh, uh i just wrote this out of uh, i guess you could say a little bit of therapy and this poem is called nonconformity in the meantime bark on the silver maple curls and sloughs the old tree hollows out with heart rot. Upper branches wither, dry in the sun. Twigs litter the unmowed yard. Grasses seed out in a sea of hawkweed, aster, mint and clover and wild geraniums and morning glories and negligence, my secret indulgence. Holding my breath when the indigo bunting shines and sings in the balding limbs. When the yard dances with butterflies. When morning dew is given a chance. That's it. Wonderful, Craig. Thank you so much. Um, Thank, thanks to all of you for, for being here, being present tonight. Um, so, um, Thank you for everyone for joining us. Um, again, I will send Craig all of your comments and questions just in case I missed something, but also so he can see all the, the kind words you've left. Um, stay tuned for our next Smitty Story Hour coming uh, January 14th featuring Leanne Sporn. I have a feeling we might talk about some ticks that night, um, but we'll send out email invitations and of course it'll be on social media too. Uh, thanks again for joining us and uh, have a safe and happy holiday season. Thanks, Heather. Craig, that was that was like so fantastic. Well, thanks, Steve. I, I thoroughly enjoyed now not being of the scientific type, about <laughs> about two thirds of that kind of went over my head. Maybe one third of it kind of went over my head. Oh. But, you know, the old my five Craig is the older I get the more I want to learn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was younger, you kind of felt like it was being forced down your throat. And the older I get, I'm like, that sounds interesting. Well, I'd love to take a class like that. That would be really yeah, interesting. Yeah. So maybe it's yeah, evolution. I, well, thanks. I, 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 I wanted to, I didn't have time. I usually try to tone down the science, science heavy part of it. Well, you, a lot of your students were <laughs> loving every minute of it. I was watching the comments flying back and forth and they're Heather, still if you can copy there. and save those for Craig. Yeah, they're Craig, still on you got there. Some, they're saying all kinds of wonderful things, Craig. Again, I'll send them all incredibly, to you. Wow. You get some incredibly loyal followers there, Craig. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you have David really Bly do. on there too from one of our one of our trustees. Oh good. Yeah. He, was he actually really asked excited. one of the questions. <laughs> um he asked the first question, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's still yeah, was, in the comment, the chats. So I see 99 plus comments in the chat. Oh, yeah. Wow. We had oh, at yeah. one point there was more than 50 people logged on. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I'm really excited for that. That's amazing. This was huge, Greg. You were a rock star, man. Well, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Imagine what will happen once oh, he publishes yeah, that book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what else is fun, Craig, is watching this, the alumni interact with each other from different class mm -hmm. years. Oh, you had wow. alums in the 70s 
posing que or answering questions from alums from the 90s and the 2000s. So, oh, nice. There's some really interesting interactions when you go back and look at that. I don't recognize the names, but you may. And uh, yeah. multi generational alumni talking back and forth with each other. Oh, here comes David. Yep, I found the place where I can let him in. Yeah, let David into this conversation. I'm trying. I he's still he's on, he's, he's still writing. <coughs> I let you in, David. Well, it says I'm talking. Well, you, we can hear you, but we don't see a smiling yeah, face to you. Yeah, I, I don't think it'll let me put his video on because well, he was on can, as a Just camera. talking about you, David. No, that, that's a nice job, Craig. Um, Thanks. Thank you. I, I wasn't sure what to expect, but it was great. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. No, David, I, I was just commenting about reading the messages back and forth between alumni from different eras. Yeah. Asking questions, answering questions. That was really fun to watch. Yeah. Well, and I, I um, there's so much to, uh, to offer out of these um, story times. I mean, I, I think it's great. And I think <clears throat> for me, a, a suggestion um, as we go forward, because I'm, I'm sure there's still people hanging on and listening. I think it would be good at the end of these to open it up where, where we have everybody, um, you know, staring at each other and catching up because. <laughs> I, I mean, We're going to get the cocktails out. We're going to be here. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, it's, it's a, it's a great um, community and, and, you know, look at all these people that, that came out and uh, it would be a great way for us to kind of reconnect see what we're doing, you know, re-engage people. Um, I think it's, it's an opportunity that we can take advantage of. And I see people going, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I see that from Bob, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was uh, um, kind of interesting to give a presentation and not see the faces, but I could see, uh, yeah, wait at the end, opening up and just seeing who's all on there. And for me, it would be very difficult to follow the chat and sure. questions and yeah. give a presentation at the same yeah. time. But, yep. but but to see um, the faces would have been pretty cool. Yep. And, and uh, you know, some, some I, I saw some people back to the early 70s. So um, 62, were, David, was the, I saw. People are still engaged. And yeah. Class of 62 was on here. Yeah. And from Colorado, out out in Colorado, how far away, out west, we had other yeah. people. Definitely people Colorado, from... but I'm not sure where else. I'll have to look. There was a lot. Oh, my gosh, there's so many chats. The questions yeah. kept disappearing. This, this can only grow. I mean, oh, Boston representing <laughs> John <laughs> O'Brien. Oh, yeah, yeah. John O'Brien. Oh. Do you remember John, Craig? Yep. Yeah, I do. Of course you do. Yep, I remember John, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just now starting to look through the names here. Doug Fitzgerald, he's local. Yep. Great guy. Emily's still listening. Emily's, you know, someone well, Of course Seattle. Emily's listening. <laughs> I'm his Emily. Uh, <laughs> oh, fun. somebody's messaging. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm gonna go and pay attention to my dear dog who is, uh, needing a love so i'm checking out nice meeting you craig hopefully david thanks for joining us. us yeah hopefully someday we'll get to meet in person yes and um steve i hope you're working on that fishing tournament because oh we are bob Vissicario. he was chiming in and out of here i, I um, saw <laughs> we're planning on a nice fishing tournament this august but uh david so you gotta be you gotta be there i'll be there all right take care hey david thanks uh, a lot care. Wow. So just hey, Bob's, yeah, still, Bob's still on here. Hey, Bob, <laughs> we got to get that fishing tournament going. <laughs> yeah, so it's, there's a lot here. Is this is this something that I can see later on to see who yep. all actually signed on? I can give you everything. On? I can Great. give you everything. It'll probably take me till tomorrow. I download it and okay. then I save it. I, I pull the contact information from when they registered. Um, and now they know all my secrets because there's still 20 people on. Well, El Millie already knew. And, <laughs> um, we got we got a hot mic here, uh, Heather. Yeah. Hot microphone. All right, no more secrets.
But um, yeah, I can get you all the information. Eventually, we will put the uh, recorded videos online so people can watch past episodes. Um, we're just, that's been a little bit of a hurdle. I'm not a, I'll get there. Yeah, but you know, Heather, we took this as a concept. I think this is end up being a very popular ongoing program. It is bringing people together um, from all across the country, different, different alumni from different years. The topics are far ranging. I, I really think we got a winning program here. We'll just keep it going. Absolutely. I'm trying Make to sure you uh, put Craig's on, on, put Craig's honorarium in the mail for me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll be waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks Heather and thanks Steve. Greg, and, uh, this is that was fascinating, really fascinating. Thank you. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Now I'm gonna. It's it's past my bedtime, so I'm gonna. <laughs> yeah, mine too. So. so. All right, and, guys. And well, if anybody thank else is so still much. listening, I'm glad you showed up. So, <laughs> have, have a great evening. All yeah, right, take thanks, care. everybody.